Hello everybody, welcome to Also Rusty Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already and drop a like on this video. I'm trying to hit 100k on this channel by the end of the year, so it'd be much appreciated. So, uh, two different, actually, I guess three game results that I'm going to talk about today. There were only two games today, but there's one game that happened yesterday that I did not watch live, and I watch and I want to talk about my thoughts on that. But all three of these games that I'm going to talk about, Nets versus Bucks from yesterday, Hawks versus Sixers today, and then Clippers versus Jazz, uh, the team I predicted to win lost all three of those games. Uh, some of them in more dramatic fashion than others. So let me first uh, talk about this Hawks game because that's probably what's going to be in the title or at least part of it. Uh, I'll be real, I did not watch the first three quarters of this game, so I'm only going to be able to tell you about the fourth quarter. I was going to be, I was, my mindset was, I'm going to watch the second half of this game if it's close. It was a 22 point lead at halftime, and I believe, according to Twitter, the lead got as big as like 26 27. Uh, so it seemed pretty much out of the hands of the Hawks to make that comeback and I said after game two when the Hawks lost because Ben Simmons defended Trey Young so well I said that uh that series is pretty much done I predicted to win in five in game four the Sixers won which or game three the Sixers won which made it 2-1 game four Sixers, Sixers had an 18 point lead which they blew uh, so it just seems that's, that's a tendency for them is they just blow big leads. When I picked the Hawks to win or to, to lose this series and that span, it was making the assumption that the Sixers were not amazing, but better than the Hawks. I have not been a big fan of the process Sixers in the past. I've expressed doubt in them multiple times. Uh, a lot of people were saying that I was crazy for predicting the Hawks to actually be able to give the Sixers a series. And I actually agreed with those people with that initial take where I was like, actually, with Joel Embiid playing well, series should probably be fine for the Sixers, probably five, six games, but apparently not. Because now they are down three to two, and they have two more games, or maybe just one more to go. So it's weird, because my prediction originally was the Hawks can give the Sixers a series, but also if Joel Embiid is healthy, no, they can't. So I guess... I don't know. It's just fucking weird in, in, in lines of what my actual predictions were because I kind of was contradictory, but it really depended entirely upon Joel Embiid's health. I'm just rambling at this point. Uh, fourth quarter of this game, it was initially Lou Williams who led the comeback. I'm not sure what exactly the point differential was going into the fourth quarter. I think it was like 16 points somewhere in that ballpark. But Lou Williams comes Lou Williams comes into the game and the Sixers are running a bench lineup, which people were talking about. But uh Lou Williams is amazing in the fourth quarter. I believe he had eleven in the third quarter, or at least he that graphic popped up. Uh so yeah, Lou Williams led this comeback initially. Then the Hawks starters along with Lou Williams came into the game. The Sixers starters come into the game, and the Hawks just gradually chipped away at the lead, and I believe was it a Trey Young was fouled on a three by Ben Simmons, and I think that was the those three free throws gave them the one point lead. Uh, I think it was one hundred five to one hundred four at that point. And once they had that, that's that was when the game was just completely in their favor. The Sixers did not do a good job at getting their own shot off. Uh, there was what was what what is I can't remember actually exactly what happened. That oh oh okay. Joel Embiid, Joel Embiid brings uh, defensive attention to the paint, but uh, Tobias Harris is open on the basket, goes for a left-hand hook. That gets swatted by John Collins, and then Tobias fouls John Collins going for the rebound. Collins goes to the line, makes his free throws, and the Sixers do not get a three off on the next possession, or at least if they did it missed. I can't remember what exactly happened. But, yeah, the Hawks took care of business in – a game that they were just completely out of. And being that this is the second game this has happened in a row, not good look for the Sixers, not a good look for Doc Rivers. That lineup kind of killed them. But at the same time, even when the starters were in, they still were not doing great. And apparently, I, I didn't watch the third quarter, but it, I, apparently Embiid and Seth Curry were the only players who scored in the second half. Uh, also, Ben Simmons free throws. That's a thing. Uh, also, Joel Embiid free throws. He did miss two at the end of this game, which was just outright choke job, but uh, overall he had a great game, so I'm not going to put the brunt of the blame on him. 
But Ben Simmons in this game, though, I did not watch it. It's, you don't have to watch a game to know that eight points on with 14 free throw attempts isn't good. How do you have six more free throw attempts than you do points? That's just downright pathetic. There's nothing else to say about it. It's just straight up not okay in any capacity to play like this, especially with your back against the wall, when you shouldn't have had your back against the wall to begin with. And he's become such a liability from the line that they're playing hack of Ben Simmons and him not being able to be on Trey Young as much. Late in that game, Trey Young was not being guarded by Ben Simmons as much. It was more Matisse Thibel. I'm not sure why that decision was made, but it was. Uh, so yeah, especially if Ben's not even going to be out there defending Trey Young to the extent that I think he should, it's just not making sense to play him, but that's enough for that game. Uh, again, I only watched the fourth quarter of that one, but the Sixers very concerning. The Hawks now have the lead in this series that should probably be over by now. Like the series, like the last two games, the Sixers should have won. So the series should be over, but it's not. So yeah, there's that. Now let me talk quickly about Bucks Nets, and I'll end on Clippers Jazz with the game that I just finished watching. Uh, I didn't watch Bucks Nets because I came home from Chicago on Tuesday and was very tired, so I just slept for like 13 hours straight through the game. I wake up, check my phone, and literally everybody and their mother is talking about Kevin Durant, and rightfully so, because this is the most dominant, and I'm choosing my words carefully there, the most dominant performance that I have ever seen from Kevin Durant. Now, it's not the best, I don't think, though it's certainly up there. I think I've seen just technically a bit more impressive-ish performances, higher points, higher efficiency, even though he had crazy high points and efficiency in this game. But this game was the one where it mattered the most. And while I tweeted that James Harden is the best player on the Nets, and I still stand by that, uh, or maybe not even may not necessarily the best player, with the very least the most impactful one on that team. Uh, what I didn't do was venture as far as to say, which is what a lot of people did, that Kevin Durant can't be the first option on a championship team, which is the dumbest fucking thing I've heard. Because obviously he can. The real reason why I believe Harden is the most important player to the Nets is just simply playmaking, and uh, that's because in Game Four, a game that I attended. Uh, the playmaking on Kevin Durant's part was not good, at least not good enough to just carry an offense entirely. Uh, but that's not to say that Kevin Durant can't be the best player on a championship team. Best players on championship teams have a limiting lim limited things about them. Like Kawhi Leonard, typically, when he was on a championship run, he couldn't be the best playmaker on his team. That was Kyle Lowry's job. The Basically, Kevin Durant just needs a guy whose job it is to be a playmaker. He had Russell Westbrook. He had Steph Curry. He has James Harden now. Uh, that's just what works well with his game, and that's not necessarily just uh, – that's not like, no, he can't be – that. okay, I'm rambling because this is a stupid fucking conversation. If you believe Kevin Durant couldn't be the best player on a championship team, you must have forgot 2014 – and the two times, or at least one, that he was the best player on a championship team. So that's just a, that was a stupid argument, and the fact that that happened to begin with was dumb. Criticizing James Harden for Game Four, not James Harden, Kevin Durant for Game Four, perfectly valid. Saying that he's not a champ, stupid. It was just stupid. Uh, but this game, I mentioned the playmaking, and while well, yeah, he had 49 points on. Wow, look at that, 69% from the field. Nice. Uh, while he did do that, the 10 assists were all very impressive. A lot of it was Jeff Green. Jeff Green was fucking awesome this game. Uh, a lot of it, there was a, a pass to Blake Griffin that was like he threaded the needle so tightly, so well. I don't know how you'd say that. He threaded the needle really well. Uh, he had a pass to, or no, he didn't have a pass. It was actually a James Harden pass. But he set a screen for Joe Harris who got a backdoor cut layup. Uh, speaking of James Harden himself, he was playmaking this one, really did not get any scoring opportunity. He hit a bank floater, I believe, and one, and that is all that he really did scoring wise, but he was playmaking. He put up threes, but they did not go in. Um, and Joe Harris had a terrible game. And you'd think that if Kevin, or if the Nets are going to win a game like this, being that the, they just had the game four that they did, you would expect that. 
Joe Harris would have a good game because he's had great games and he would be the second option at this point. But no, the guy who stepped out outside of Kevin Durant, because as good as he was, he couldn't do it himself. The guy who stepped up was Jeff Green. Now, this does not surprise me. He, he This is one of the best Jeff Green games. He was 7 for 8 from 3, 8 for 11 from the field overall, which is phenomenal. And he hit a couple of threes. There was one, speaking of Kevin Durant passes, there was one where he, Kevin Durant ran to the basket and threw it like way back cross court to Jeff Green, who was trailing, who nailed a three in Giannis's face. Like that was such a great pass, such a great shot. And Jeff is just good. And I don't understand why he keeps getting minimum contracts on these championship level teams. I understand why they're giving it to him, but I don't understand why he's not perceived to have more value than that because Jeff Green is like an $8 million plus dollar a year player and he plays like it in the playoffs routinely. Think about how fucking great he was for the Rockets. Think about how good he was for the 2018 Cavs, a little bit more inconsistent than he is now, but still good. Jeff Green is just consistently really good, and I don't know why he's always like the, oh, we'll throw that guy a vet's min minimum. He is routinely has not games of this capacity, but there's pretty much always in any playoff series that he's been in the last couple of seasons, there's almost always the Jeff Green game. I may or may not have mentioned it in my preview for the Bucks net series, but there's almost always one Jeff Green game among a seven-game series, and this was clearly it. Uh, I also have to mention, because a lot of the praise went Kevin Durant's way naturally, Jeff Green's way secondary. Um, Blake Griffin was awesome in this game, and I don't know why that has kind of gone unmentioned. A couple of threes, things like that. Uh, layup that he finished I believe he had a dunk am I crazy did he have a dunk I can't remember now uh but he got sat basically after the first quarter in game four in this game even though Jeff Green was amazing he still managed to find his way on the floor and do the right things offensively pretty much every time uh so credit to Blake Griffin for that on the Buck side of things they had a really big lead in the or what was it like they had a big lead pretty much up to like halfway through the third quarter and it was at that point that Kevin Durant really flipped the switch and just became more and more ridiculous. He was already having a good game, but it turned to like, okay, there's no stopping this guy. Um, Chris Middleton, they actually the, the Nets actually did a poor job defending him initially. There was action where he had stopped with the ball and then there was stuff going on off ball and then all of the Nets defenders just left him open. Uh, there was a switch where Mike James had to check him and that resulted in and one. There's a couple of possessions where the Nets were sloppy in that regard, but second half really wasn't doing much. And that was partially because of defense, partially just missing shots. Giannis finishes the game with 34 and 12, but settling for jumpers as usual, uh, fumbling the ball in situations where you wouldn't want him to. It was more of him initiating plays, which I thought we had stepped away from. Uh, another thing I want to point out is Drew Holiday has to chill it with the step back threes because, man, he just takes them too much. He's not good enough at those to be taking them a lot. It's, it's not a bad shot, but he goes to it a little too frequently for how good he actually is at it. Uh, other than that, I feel like my my guy, Nicholas Henkel, who's a, a Bucks fan secondary to being a Pistons fan, he was complaining about Bobby Portis not getting in this game. Uh, there were stretches where the shooting was not the best, which is, hey, that's nothing abnormal for uh, the Bucks. There were some stretches like that, and having him out there would be nice. Also more capable de defending in the pick and roll and stepping up, unlike Brooke Lopez. There were a couple of possessions where Kevin Durant specifically targeted Brooke Lopez, and it was a bucket pretty much every time. Um, Mike Budenholzer not pulling out of the game was something that was questionable. There were a lot of questionable things from Mike Budenholzer in this one. Uh, Giannis needs to guard Kevin Durant. I think that's abundantly clear. P.J. Tucker did a great job in Game 4, but it can only go so far. Uh, but yeah, I think I've talked about that game enough. It's weird watching a game after it actually happened, so I already kind of knew it was going to happen, but yeah. Anyways, uh, Clippers, this is going to be a long one. I decided to do just one video instead of two because I only watched the fourth quarter of Hawks Sixers and it felt like it would be kind of fucked up to make that the title and then I would talk about it for like three minutes and then talk about Bucks Nets. So Clippers versus Jazz. I just cut because I coughed really loudly. Uh, this game, I just made a video talking about the Chris Paul injury or Chris Paul COVID as well as Kawhi Leonard's ACL injury. And after that, I was like, does, 
the Utah Jazz are probably getting a free pass to the finals right now because I don't know that the Clippers get more than one game off of them without Kawhi Leonard. Now, that being said, there's a very real chance that this was just that one game, but I have to give credit where credit is due to the Clippers here. And this is a weird thing with this Clippers team is I keep finding myself slandering them and then crediting them and then slandering them and then crediting them. It's like they just are so wishy-washy. But Paul George with 37-16-5 on 54-33-91 splits. He'd have five turnovers, so there's that. But he absolutely flawlessly led the charge for the Clippers in this one. And this is when everybody basically looked at Paul George unanimously. After Kawhi's, Kawhi's injury, it's like, okay, now it's Paul George time. And playoff P, it's playoff P time. Playoff P was a real thing today. Like, not a meme. Like, actually, he played great. Uh, and it was not abnormal Paul George stuff. And, like, typically when you look at his underperformances in the playoffs, it's not because he can't get his shot off or he's just defended so well that he's putting up tough shots. Like, he, he takes tough shots routinely, but that's pretty much his standard. Really, bad Paul George playoff games come when he's just not making shots that he normally makes. This time, he made the shots that he normally makes. That's pretty much as far as it went. It's typical Paul George offense, but it was working today, unlike it, unlike game one and in other playoff games in the past. And especially, he has not been in a situation where he's the first option on a playoff team since, or at least maybe not the first scoring option, but at the very least, like the only star caliber player on the floor since he was with the Pacers. This is the first time that's happened. So... That, yeah, that's a big deal. Uh, and he absolutely showed out when he did that. Other guys who showed out, uh, Marcus Morris Sr. as well as Reggie Jackson. Now, Marcus really scored within the flow of the offense. There were some pull-up mid-range shots and things like that that he's one to do. But for the most part, it wasn't that abnormal. He just had a good, pretty standard game. Uh, but then Reggie Jackson had what's becoming a standard game. Uh, with 22 points, a lot of those points coming in the fourth quarter, he hit a crazy difficult mid-range shot at the top of the key, uh, a huge, uh, maybe two huge threes down the stretch in this one. He's just been amazing. Terrence Mann has been amazing. He got a not dunk dunk over uh, Rudy Gobert, although I only saw the replay because I, I heard the call and I was like, wait, what the fuck happened? And then I saw the replay. Um, it didn't look like he really dunked it well, but it, it got in, so it doesn't matter. It was an and one. Uh, he also hit a big three, uh, in, I think it was the third or fourth quarter, or I, th I think it was the fourth quarter, pretty sure. Uh, I haven't even talked about the jazz side of things, so let me do that. Um, the reason why that three was big is that while the game was around, I think the clip, I think the jazz were up five at halftime. I think it was 65, 60. Uh, after that, the Clippers gradually... Uh, got into it, but then the Jazz, and, and then got a lead, but the Jazz started creeping back in, but a Terrence Mann three, and then I believe a Reggie Jackson three pretty soon after, really started to put this one away more, and then Paul George became the closer, and he didn't make, I don't know that he actually made any shots late, late in this game, but he hit his free throws, and there was one possession in particular where it wasn't like intentional to not get a shot off, but because they technically drained 24 seconds off of the clock that was something i guess uh if you're gonna not score on the possession at the very least take up the most of your opponent's time when you have a lead uh as for how this game started it looked like the jazz were about to run away with it because bojan bogdanovich was six for six from three in the first quarter so it's the third time that's happened now the previous record in the first half for three pointers was six by michael jordan uh, and that's happened three times now. I don't know if he actually hit a seventh one to break the record. I didn't actually check and see if that happened, because uh, I don't think he did, but uh, he finished with nine, and he had a great game. Uh, Rudy Gobert was really good with some offensive rebounds, some tip-ins and things like that. He had five boards, offensive boards in this one. There's a putback dunk, two different putback layups. Uh, so he had, a play he had a good game in that regard, although he did get taken to the rim by Paul George and Reggie Jackson at different points in this game. That was another thing Reggie did is he had a really nice drive on Rudy Gobert on a switch. Uh, other than that, Donovan Mitchell didn't really have to do much offensively early in this game because Bogdan was doing what he or Bo, Bogdanovich was doing what he was doing. Uh, but then later in the game, he was kind of called upon, and 
yeah, it, it was okay. Uh, he didn't really get into his, the thing is that he wasn't really asked to do much until later in the game. And by then his rhythm was pretty, not pretty, not, not ideal. I'll say that. Uh, so that held him back. Uh, and he had a, he had a big three, but that was about it as far as I can remember in terms of big shots from him. So that's not ideal. Uh, Jordan Clarkson had a very, very hot first half. Uh, where he was just shooting crazy ass threes. Every shot that he takes is like a heat check, heat check type of shot, and it either goes in or it, or it doesn't. Either way, it's fun as hell. Actually, it's not really fun as hell when it doesn't, but it's definitely fun as hell when it's going in. Uh, as for the future of this series, Mike Conley has to fucking play. If he is capable of playing, he has to play. Just, that's just period. Uh, that will definitely probably get you to the point where it's like as good as Paul George can play. That will probably be overwhelming. Uh, I don't know that you can expect, even though he's been good, and both of them have been good, really, a Reggie Jackson and Marcus Morris to combine for 47 points. Um, so assuming you can just contain Paul George and the other role players don't have crazy games, maybe one of them does, but not two, and you do that for the next two games and uh, Mike Conley comes back, you have uh, Donovan Mitchell play better, I think you're probably relatively secure and still winning this series. That being said, don't play with your food because right now you see yourself with the advantage when previously most people expected the Clippers to win this series. Don't waste this opportunity without Kawhi Leonard playing. This was the longest post-game recap in a long fucking time. But yeah, uh, that's it. Goodbye.